Okay, see, I told you I didn't want to be <clears throat> doing this for seven weeks, but here we are. <clears throat> it's okay, nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> um, so, I laid out the churches in a linear way so we could look at the pattern. Um, each one of these messages should stand or be able to stand by itself. Um, but we're looking at a collective um, body, if you will. And what's interesting, um, just it's something that I was reading, and it just dawned on me. In each case, when we read in the New Testament, apart from the Gospels that um, obviously eyewitnesses pen, apart from that, What's interesting is that there, there hasn't been a place other than in Revelation where the Lord himself says, commissions to write something. Uh, exactly, write this. These are commissioned, write to each one of these. And I guess as we've gone through, I've tried to highlight um, not just the description of Christ and the commendation, the rebuke if there was any, the exhortation, the alternative, and the reward, but I've tried to highlight also, it's very easy to get caught up in something. Uh, as I said, traditionally, these churches are taught as church ages. I originally taught it as church ages. And I'm not insinuating or saying that I would like to change my position. The only problem with that is I think that we tend to not take or try to make an application to ourselves. And each one of these is valuable for that purpose. This church... Laodicea, the final one, is perhaps the worst of all the churches. Now, those people who uh, write volumes of books, and especially those in the traditional pattern, will say that Laodicea represents the church in the last days, representing this church here. And we're talking not this church here, but in this time, this day and age. Um, that may or may not be true if we look at the real problem, the real issue, which I'm going to read in a minute uh, of this church. However, I want to say that it's like anything else. Um, I'm sure that there have been churches through time, through the ages, that have fit the bill of this church called Laodicea. Uh, I will read the text, and then I'm going to go to a few historical things, and then we'll get into the body of the text so that is Revelation 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, or neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest also mayest be clothed that the shame that, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesop, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, we've gone through this passage many times. Traditional error, traditional error of men interpreting Scripture always uses this passage specifically, this I stand at the door and knock, as an invitation to people to, quote-unquote, receive the Lord Jesus Christ. The only problem is this is a letter to a church. And so it, that being a letter to a church, it clearly says that Christ is standing outside the church, not outside a bar somewhere. 
I've always said Christ is inside the bar. <laughs> but here he's outside the church. So, you know, if you are into those, reading those books that are, uh, that lean a little bit more to, to the traditional, we'll, we'll come to that text, but I want you to just get it out of your head. This is not a plea for those people as though Christ is some beggar standing, trembling at the door and asking people if he can come in, begging them to come in. Uh, he's outside of the church. Now, I said, if you want to go with the church ages, there's, there's, there's some good logic to say that this probably is the age in which we are in, simply because I feel that most people have pushed Christ out of the church. As I've told you, I've done my share of looking on uh, Christian television and listening to some programs where you just say, and was this a Christian program? Because I know it's a Christian program because it's on Christian television, but was this a Christian program? Did I miss something? That's the idea of Christ being pushed outside. Um, unfortunately, fortunately for you, unfortunately in the universe of Christendom, not too many people actually study the Bible. And even fewer, as I'm uh, trying to, as I told you, trying to complete my PhD and finding out how few people actually are committed uh, just in the theological universe, those people who are doing degrees in divinity and other things, how few are actually committed to mining and combing the scriptures. It seems like um, there are fewer and fewer people who are actually interested in that field. Uh, we'll say it's quickly becoming a field of extinction, I believe, from what I see. Um, now, with that being said, let's talk a little bit of the historical thing of this nature of this church. Uh, Laodicea, the name Lao from people, Decia, we can say the voice of the people. Um, it's interesting that this church, by the way, has no commendation in it, uh, but the voice of the people versus the voice of God speaking or, or the other churches who could at least hear. And that's not a full indictment because the final word to this church is he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Essentially saying... The voice of the people took that prominent position, but if there was the ability for anyone to hear and receive, let him hear and receive. Historically, and we'll have to revisit this, if you remember in the latter chapters of Daniel, uh, specifically in, I believe in, we went through chapters 10 and 11, um, there's that kind of great history, lots of history woven in there. And I'm now beginning to see if we kind of look at these different churches, you'll find that some of the same history uh, because of those four generals of Alexander the Great, that separation uh, after the death of Alexander the Great, you'll find a lot of that history is actually woven into some of these churches in their background, not in the churches themselves, but in their background. This is one of those. Um, Laodicea, it is historically noted, uh, was founded by Antiochus II, fortified city, originally called Diospolis. And I'm not sure if Diospolis could be understood as we understand Dios, uh, Latinized for God, the city of God that became the place of the people. But it was named after his wife, Laodicea, which becomes Laodicea as a city. If you're going in the horseshoe, as I've tried to paint it, six miles south of here, six miles, Hierapolis, 11 miles west Colossae, and 100 miles east of Ephesus, all very important for a reason. For this particular church, important for a reason, specifically the proximity of Colossae, because it is also believed, if you are going to kind of put things together, that the Colossian letter that was penned by Paul, perhaps some 40 years, somewhere in there, 40 years earlier, um, potentially had been around and circulated because there are, there are essential issues to this church that one could easily reference back to Paul's writing and see that there is a correlation. I'll highlight them momentarily. Uh, we know that Papias, for example, pastored the church at Hierapolis. We know about Polycarp, both of these being eyewitnesses to John, the one who penned Revelation. Um, but if you read Colossians, you also read Archippus, who it is, I speculate, was a pastor of 
either this church or the church at Colossae. It's hard to uh, get a solid foundation for that, but closely connected in terms of their proximity, undoubtedly, and many people ha have hypothesized that the letter to the Ephesians, undoubtedly, even though it's uh, over 100 miles away, circulated also to this church. And there's good reason for that if you're reading the historical records, naming the, the church fathers. You get a real feel that these letters had circulated. We're talking about John writing this late 90s, and Paul's writing perhaps in, in the early to mid 50s. Doesn't matter, they were still, still circulating. So you can get a feel that there are some issues that uh, perhaps were germane to this area. Who knows? Um, there's also a mention in the Colossian letter to Paul greets a certain nymphus. And just FYI, because nymphus is in the accusative, nymphus could either be a man or a woman. That's just, that's just a not a good name, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> If you name your child that, there's something wrong with you. But Nymphus had obviously a church in his or her home. Paul is saluting this individual. And the mention of Laodicea, I believe, occurs four or five times in the Colossian letter. So this is probably one of the few churches, apart from Ephesus, where we can say there's some substantiation within Scripture with multiple references. Laodicea was known for its medical school. And this is probably, this is where I, I, I'm going to say something and I'm just going to reference it. And you can do whatever you want with it. It was known for its medical school and the teacher who was the instructor of this school um, perfected compound medicines for compound diseases of the eyes and the ears, specifically a tablet type that was crushed into powder and mixed with oil for the eyes. Now again, I, I'm going to refer back to this because I vacillate on whether in the context of this le letter, um, the fact that it, it, there's a reference to that thou anointest thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see, uh, whether this was a, a reference to something local um, which has a double meaning metaphorically, allegorically, however you want to refer to it. But there are several things that are germane to this local church that are embedded in this letter, which has me wondering if perhaps these things were said in a specific way. It would be like a letter being written to this church specifically talking about forest lawn across the street and being that specific. These folks... Um, equally, I, I'm going to make a reference about the reference that is in this letter to hot or cold or lukewarmness. Um, equally, this place, Laodicea, was plagued with a super big problem. It had no water. It had to pipe in its water from about six miles away through an intricate set of pipes. And as the water came from the source, it was cold. As it worked its way down, it would get lukewarm. Now, is that, a, is that a definite reference? No. There's a reason why hot or cold is being referenced, but could that be implied as something these people would understand and know in terms of uh, wordplay? It's possible. I'm not going to say absolutely not. It's possible. Uh, I believe that Christ, just as he does in every generation, in every age, speaks to people exactly where they are. It's not untenable. I can't rule it out. I'm just telling you that there are certain things in here that are very unique to this place that perhaps were word place and perhaps not. <clears throat> With that being said, um, the church had grown very fat and very complacent, temporarily wealthy, spiritually destitute. Now, let me pause there for a second. This is a big problem today. Churches that are very wealthy, they build big buildings. I'm not against that. Big buildings, big flash, multi-million dollar production. It's all about how much and how much and how much. And the spiritual ingestion, if you will, of, of material, of study, of taking in, of processing, of hunger, very low. 
These are the same churches, by the way. I was having a conversation with somebody. Actually, it was an email exchange with somebody who was busy telling me about so-and-so, such-and-such an evangelist that just came to town for a couple of nights. And the place is packed. And I said, well, you know, let me go on the Internet and see if I can find a balcony, a picture of heaven. I was looking for a cartoon <laughs> with about three or four people sitting in it. Because that may be packed and lots of people there, but that may be empty with very few sitting there. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, there's a great discrepancy in people's understanding. They think because the masses are there, that makes it great. When in fact, I look to Christ's ministry and I see this little band. Look, in John 6 and 66, he's telling the people, will you also go also? Will you also go away? Because many stopped following him when he began to speak of the cross. There is the problem, friends. You begin to preach about death and I die daily and talk about the cross and, oh, the blood of Jesus. And that's not popular. I just told somebody yesterday, if you decide in your mind, you know, that, that, that thing that you've been vacillating with, you know, you, you start studying the Bible or you're hearing the Word, and then suddenly there's something that's there, and you think, well, I should, I should be following, right? I should be listening. I should be involved. And the minute you do that, oh, Dr. Scott used to say it right, oh, hell's going to break loose. You come to God, all hell's going to break loose. And it's not as though that's going to last forever. But I believe it really is. I view, I'm sorry, you could take it however you want. I view God as he's got the pan, the sand, and there's some gold specks in there, and he's busy sifting away because he doesn't want all the junk. I'm sorry. And he's going to sift until the, the, the things that he wants are sifted enough sufficiently. And then there's the other sifting that happens which Jesus warned Peter of. Satan desires to sift you as wheat. You, know, you get it from both sides. Sorry to tell you that, but if you come, <laughs> you're going to get it from both sides. And, you know, the scripture says God's no respect of persons. That's right. You're going to get it from both sides. But what I want to tell you is that is a big problem today. And unfortunately... I see a lot more of the interest in the magnitude of the work in terms of numbers, in terms of what is flash, in terms of production. No. You know, let's just take this ministry. Uh, this ministry never had fancy production by any means. Uh, and I'm going to leave that, park that thought for a minute because I don't want to get distracted. Never had fancy production. Um, just the word. And I was thinking about this the other day. Just the word must be able, and it's based on that alone. It cannot be these other things. These other things, they may look great to your eye, but they will mean nothing in heaven. They may look great on TV. They may actually have some, something, a, an appeal, a draw. People looking in say, wow, there's lots of people there. Therefore, that means that's good. Therefore, I should be there. If there's lots of people there, chances are I should probably go away from there. That's how I take it. But that is how we're conditioned. So these people, they, they really have a, a serious problem. And the problem, as I said, was in their time and is still today. So we're going to go through this and we're going to see what we might glean for ourselves. Um, beginning with the description of Christ here. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, many have done um, interpretations of this, which created a lot of heresies in the early church, uh, specifically the beginning of the creation of God, because there were those factions in the early church that said that Christ was created, not part of the creation. In, in order to understand this aright, you've got to look at this in a proper context. The amen, faithful, true witness is related to Christ's death and resurrection, which is noted in Revelation 1.5 and in 1.18 as the resurrected one, and therefore he is the beginning of the new creation, not the beginning 
of the creation as one who's created because he was in the beginning. John says he was in the beginning. In the beginning of creation, he was there, not created. That's, that's the early church controversy. So this must be understood in proper context. Jesus is the inaugurator of the new creation. We're talking about our ability to be reconciled to God by him. So it must be understood that way. The other thing is the amen, we talk about the equal of the amen into the Greek, into the New Testament, because it's interesting that it would be used as amen, which is more of a Hebraism than the Greek version, which would be pistos. But in any event, he represents the, we'll call it the stamp, the final seal of God making good on his word. Now, to this church, this is what's interesting, to this church, referred to as the amen, the faithful and true witness, as opposed to these people who represent the exact opposite. This is how he appears to them. There's something very ironic. The rest of these appearances, if you look carefully, first and last, dead, alive, uh, sharp sword, two edges, son of God, eyes of flame of fire. But this one, this description here, is almost like the antithesis of what these people were at this church. So it's kind of a sad commentary to begin with. Secondarily, if you keep reading, um, you'll find that this first verse, um, verse 14, really does reach back to Isaiah. Now, a lot of times I've told you the Bible confirms itself. We don't need to try and look for something and pick it up independently. If you just note it down somewhere, Isaiah 65 and verse 16 refers to the God of Amen. Be Elohim, Amen. Same God yesterday, today, and forever. The same concepts are being dinned in over and over again. He is also called faithful and true witness repeatedly. If you want to go back again, Isaiah is the one that really gives echoes these patterns that we tend to read independently in the New Testament, but it's as though, as though God is saying, I have not changed. He said it in Malachi, I am God, I change not. You'll find that he's been saying the same thing about himself. I am in other places referred to as the Amet God, but the Amen God, the one who is in verity, in absolute truth, when he says he will do something, he will do it. And this, this one who said he would be raised up from the dead is now standing and saying to this church, right. Now, if we can even glean from that, because we get familiar with these passages, so we can even glean from that, that the resurrected one is talking and saying now, this is who's, this is who's telling you this. I know thy works, which has been the repeated pattern through all of these churches. I know thy works. Christ knows what, what is going on in each and every church, which should actually make me just shut my mouth because earlier I said I want to talk to God about this when I get there. But he knows all about it. Now somebody might say if he knows all about it, why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he shut some of these things down? Why doesn't he, well... Maybe he doesn't want to. And that's his business. Now, I can stand up here and lament all I want, but in the big picture, the sole thing I need to do is stand here and preach the word to you. And he'll work out the rest, whatever, whatever that rest may be. So to this church in Laodicea, to this church faith center, to churches everywhere, he's still saying the same thing. I know thy works. I know what you're doing. I know... Let's just put it this way in straight terms. I know your commitment, your faithfulness, or your lack thereof. But to this church, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that, that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now I want you to think about this. Because we tend to equate being hot as being zealous right, being zealous for the Lord, which is exactly the same, the thing that um, the church at Ephesus, they lost their first love, but they had to have zeal at the first, and were told to repent and go back and do their first works over. Here, 
the, the main issue is we're talking about hot or cold. And it's not as though Christ is saying, I prefer you to be either or. He says the main problem is that you're lukewarm. Now, some people have interpreted that to mean that somebody is right in the middle. But how about lukewarm is that they were either cold, and that is they were cold, for example, like Zacchaeus was cold, right, against, and then became, he heard, he wanted to see, he listened, they came out of that house, and he was then hot for the Lord. We might say hot and cold is the Apostle Paul, although he was hot for God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, he became cold at the same time to Christ, and then in his conversion, after his conversion, became hot or zealous for the Lord. So lukewarm cannot be simply like opening up the water and it's just lukewarm. It's a product of either something that was hot, that has become cool, or something that was cold that's somewhere now in the middle. And if you've ever... I know because I've experienced it on a really hot day when you've taken a hot bottle, a cold bottle of water and kept it outside long enough and you're really thirsty for a drink and you take a, take a sip and it's, it's not quite hot enough to be tea, but it's not quite cold enough to be refreshing. And yeah, right? <laughs> well, that's the carnal, <laughs> that's the carnal interpretation. But what I'm trying to say to you is it's something that changed from. It's not just that it was lukewarm. This is the other tendency then. You need to, we need to be clear about this, um, that these folks had either been hot for the Lord and became lukewarm or cold, because he says, I wish that you'd be one or the other. Now, the great problem with this interpretation is it's as though Christ is saying that he might even be approving of cold. Well, if you go back into the New Testament, he says it's easier for harlots and the publicans to be saved, and that we'll put that as the picture of cold, than it is for the Pharisees and the scribes, those that, that look like the learned spiritual ones. So we might even understand it like that. Um, but let's continue on, because there's some interesting things in here that I think we should definitely pay attention to. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable and poor and blind and naked. Well, that's not the gentle Jesus I want to follow. No, I want Jesus to tell me how lovely I am and how marvelous I am, right? Could you imagine going to some of these big churches, some of these, call them the Laodicean-type churches, and the pastor stands up and says, you bunch of wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked fools. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Right? Oh, praise God. Right. It's a terrible thing. If you think about it, the church, this church is in the worst state, does not view itself that way. So we have a real um, distinction. How, when Christ says, I know thy works... He also knows what they say of themselves and what the reality is. Now, you can, this is so simple that you can even probably miss what I'm saying because it's that simple. It's very easy for any church, not just a big Laodicean type church. It's very easy for any church to get into that mode of saying, we don't need anything, we're good, and in fact, substitute which is the common preachment, especially in today's uh, universe, of temporal blessings, tangible temporal blessings, in substitution for those spiritual things that are only obtained by God and through God as a gift. So easy to do. This is how, if, if people would take the time, and I'm telling some of you out there in the listening audience who don't attend, but you listen, take the time to follow Christianity, the birth of, of modern Christianity in America, and I'm specifically talking about after Azusa Street, after the events of Azusa Street. I don't care whether you're for or against, you believe or you don't believe, but I really urge you to do a little bit of history reading about what happened here to follow a cataclysmic change 
in Christendom after that time, specifically starting with crusades by one or two individuals that changed the face of Christianity, making it a more popular, more fashionable, more whatever you want to call it. And then, of course, a little bit later, um, probably the one who I think kind of dirtied the waters in terms of a modern framework, really, the finger points back to Oral Roberts. And you might say, well, the man's dead, don't say that. But I'm telling you, if you look at what happened, you find that a lot of the solicitation, how money is raised, how, how people, gullible, wanting to believe somehow. There's nothing wrong with faithing through the word and practicing and putting faith into action. But there's something inherently wrong when you promise somebody something, when a man or a woman promises something to you that is temporal, that I cannot make good on. I can tell you about the promises in the book, and I can tell you those promises, the scripture says, are yea and amen, because Christ has made them, has sealed them as, as the amen speaking to this church and through the ages. But anyone who promises you a temporal blessing Run for us, and run as fast as you can, because with that temporal promise usually comes temporal lies. And they're always, it's always in the same area. If you, I'm telling you, if you watch any of these ministries, it's always on one thing. You'll find poor people. Now, I may sound like the people who criticize ministries like this out of ignorance, but you'll find it's poor people who are poor. They are destitute poor. They'll come into a meeting where the preacher says, you know, listen, you got a credit card? You know, charge it up to the max and give, and you'll find that if you can charge your credit card to the max, you know, you see these people that say they have, you know, they've, they've, they've got their mortgage, their car, they're losing everything, and then, you know, they maxed out their credit card because this one guy on TV said you ought to do that, and then suddenly a check came in the mail and magically paid all their bills, and everything's, you know, it's all worked out, and even got, they even got gold in their teeth. <laughs> Right? You remember that one, right? Sister so-and-so, come here, open your mouth. I want to see how much gold Jesus put in your mouth today. Hey, listen, if, if, if your Jesus can only fill your teeth with gold, and that's the type of promises you got and can't put in your pocket in your bank account, there's something wrong with Jesus or there's something wrong with you. And I'm going to take the something wrong with you. But, but wait a minute. I don't, I don't want to be misunderstood. Jesus is not uh, promising to put gold in my pockets or in my bank account either. I think the promise, I'm not telling you Christians should be poor either. I'm not saying you got to scratch and you got to be destitute. But I think the real reality is there is, there is just in this church spells it out, the peril of prosperity. You know when things are going good. Come on, be honest now. When things have been going really good in your life, so good that, come on, don't lie about it. You kind of slacked off on the urgency of things, the urgency of prayer, the urgency of what I see. Yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah. You know it's true. We, that's human nature. Come on, to slack off. That's the perils of prosperity. So this church, thinking it is greatly blessed by the temporal things, is spiritually destitute. Now, I'm telling you, it's easy to get into this mindset and forget that we are also always in danger. You can always begin to rely on the arm of the flesh. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Oh, you see, Jesus wants me to be rich. You see that? Right there. Right? But in reality, and it's very simple. If you read this just the way it is very simple, the... I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire represents riches that are unobtainable by any other means save through Christ. Things that have been tried by fire. He's using gold as a type. Gold tried in the fire. But something that we buy of him. Now what can you buy of him and what's the method? What is the, the cash method of buying from him? except faith. You cannot buy God. You cannot appease God with money, but you can certainly have faith, and that faith 
Just what Isaiah 55 talks about, that people always warp out of context. When it says, come and buy of me, referring to food, those even that don't have money, and they always use that as a context to say, see, you should never give because it's all free. No, that's not what that means. It means the things that we need of him, he will grant to us, not the things that we need for us in our way. He may grant those. Remember, I refer to it often. You know what I'm going to say. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things shall be added, the things that he knows you need, that you need. Now, that became the license for people to say, well, but shouldn't I get what I want? You know, Mick Jagger was right. You can't always get what you want. There's something spiritual about that, but you get what you need. I mean, that's the most spiritual thing I can say about the man. Great musician, that's the most spiritual thing I can say about the man. <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. So, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And interestingly enough, he's not saying buy a white suit so you can look spiritual. <laughs> the white raiment definitely represents his righteousness. This is why I, I referenced Matthew 6.33, because the whole concept is you must go to him by faith. He dispenses that white raiment. This is just like, you know, Scripture confirms itself. This is Joshua standing uh, in uh, Zechariah in dirty garments, take off his dirty garments, clothe, clothe him with fest, festive ones, clean ones, festive ones. He's the one that does this, though. So I want you to think about this. These people have a spiritual problem. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now, is this a cloaked reference to the thing that they produce there, their eye salve? I don't think so. I reference it because many people speculate that. What I believe is that he was basically saying, you cannot see apart from me. Remember, Christ said, With, without me, you can do nothing. You cannot see apart from me. You cannot see your true state. You cannot see your true condition. You cannot see, as he said, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You cannot see. You walk around, oh, I'm, I'm good. How are you, right? You're good. How am I? As many as I love, and this is the, probably the strangest part of this whole uh, letter to Laodicea, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As many as I love, you would think it's Christ speaking. You would think that he would be saying, as many as I love, agape. But he's not saying that. He says, as many as I phileo. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. Because you'd expect, remember in that great discourse in John 21 between Peter and the Lord? You know I love you, right? Agape. But Peter turns around and says, phileo, back to the Lord. Three times, Christ condescends down to him and says, you know, I, agape, I phileo you too. That doesn't sound good either. <laughs> I love the fact that we have a cardinal church here, and I can, I can crack a couple of jokes, and no one's, and if you're offended, it's okay. Uh, I ain't going to change. <laughs> All right, let's get back into this. So the reason why I find this is such an anomaly is he says, as many as I love, not agape, but phileo. And you who have followed the teaching here and you who study Greek words know, in English we've got one word for love. Greek has four words for love, four different words. Uh, one of them is never used in the Bible. That's eros. We get our word erotic from that. And then three other words, stergain, which is the family type of love, like a father for a son or daughter. Uh, agape, which is unconditional, uncalculated love. And phileo, we get Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. I do for you, you do for me. So it's a very interesting use of the word, as many as I love. And there's something very tender about this. And this is what I, I would hope that we'd all latch on to. This church, 
completely going in the wrong direction, the worst of all the churches. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. In other words, okay, so you've gone off the track, Laodicea, or whatever the church is that's gone off the track. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. It's as if, you know, again, Scripture confirms itself. You'll find the same concept in Hebrews You'll find the same concept, believe it or not, nestled in between two passages in James. You'll find that over and over again, it is the love of God, His love towards us. He knows our state. He knows our, the, the possibility, but He knows our works. He knows our ways. To still say, here, I rebuke and chasten. I still love you enough to try and kick you back into shape. Now, God help the people who get grooved into a church where they think somehow they got to, you know, you got to walk the straight and narrow. I wouldn't want to be in a place where somebody said, hey, listen, if you, if you even blink the wrong way, you're going to hell. I've heard so many people talk about even the most mundane things and then say, well, and this person can't be saved. This is the problem I have with Christianity today at large, but overall. There's never any room for grace anymore. There's never a message that says, you know what, I don't care where you've been or, or how good you think you've been, you're going to need God's grace. I don't care about, you know, if, if you and I fit into the, the Laodicean church, which I'm going to say I, I don't believe we've ever stood here. I've, I've not stood and said, hey, we're this and we're that. We just, it's week to week, month to month. We, we, we survive because we overcome through Christ. Faith is the key. But I'm telling you something. The message of grace, just right here in this verse 19, says, even to this church... So gone, so derailed, as many as I love, even if it's a, a notch down from that unconditional, no strings attached, I rebuke and I chasten. You don't look at this letter and say, he's calling them out on the mat. He says, I know all about you. I know where you are now. Here's the deal. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Get back on board with me. It is, it is a clear message of grace. It's a clear call of grace. In fact, it's a clear call to anybody today. This is the one thing. If you want to press a nerve with me, this is the one thing that gets me about most of the preaching and most of the people that I encounter. And I'm going to tell you what it is. I've got to take this time because this is the thing that I have walked around with for years, wrestling down the same insanity, and it's everywhere. Tell me, what good is it to have a Savior who cannot, as we sing songs, who cannot wash your sins away? You become a new creature in Christ. You become dual, if you will, because the flesh is still housed in the flesh. You tell me how you are supposed to fit into the mold of some of these people that say, now, in order for you to be saved, and they put you through the hoops, and you must keep jumping through the hoops, and it's a lifelong Pavlov's dog to get you to heaven versus the thing that my Bible clearly says. He shed his blood. He went to die for you and me. Colossians talks about it. Ephesians talks about it. Galatians talks about it. Every single book, book after book, tells me the same thing. And doesn't say somehow, look, you come in, and you better act right, and you better look right, and you better change your way. This is... It's a Dan song, Sister Sal. But I, I read this and I think to myself, this is the church gone astray. And Jesus is still saying, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. And what does Hebrews tell us? It's just like this. If you're not rebuked or chastened, you must not be his child. He's only going to rebuke and chasten those that are his. You can do whatever you want with that. You can be offended by that, and you can say, I don't like that. But that's just the way it is. It's God's way of dealing with man. And the bottom line is, it's also God's way of saying, yes, the worst church in the book right here 
before the church essentially disappears from the pages of this book. And he's still offering a measure of grace to those people. And if he's still offering a measure of grace to those people, how much more to we who have this whole book to look at and understand a whole record, church after church, age after age, right until this day. And that door of grace is still open. What makes me sad, what makes me cringe, is the church has basically forgotten the message of grace, unmerited favor. That means no matter where you come from, no matter where you've been, or maybe you've been in the church and maybe you've slipped the missing one. You know, those are the people that are never talked about because we don't want to talk about those people that fall back because that means that maybe my preaching or somebody else's preaching is ineffective. We won't talk about the individual themselves or the devil. But the bottom line is, if you're not listening to the message of grace, and if you can't hear that it's available to you today, and it's available to you today, and it's available for me, and it's available as long as I understand, you understand, just like these people, they did nothing. They thought they were okay. They're rich. They're okay. They got whatever they have, spiritually destitute. And Christ turns around and says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. There's still time for you to change your way of thinking, your mind, and begin to follow him again. And he's not asking you or me to make an open display. You know, for years, people would send me letters, and they would criticize me and say, no, I, I, whatever, for whatever the reasons they think that I should have repented publicly for whatever. Um, obviously, no, let me just tell you something. Yeah, I should repent publicly. I should repent for staying here uh, under, under those conditions. Uh, because the same individual would leave and not, be subject, not become subject to that. But apart from that, I read nowhere, not of a preacher, not of a parishioner. The only thing that you and I are required to do is talk to God and tell him about it. He knows all about it, just like this. I know thy works. He's saying, I know all about Melissa Scott. I know all about you. He's saying, I know all about you, and I know all about you, and I know all about you. I know about you all. Y'all, because he might be from Texas. <laughs> And yet, I'm not even going to ask for hands to go up because I know the truth of the matter is that we all at times have felt as though we have been rebuked and chastened by God. God knows exactly what we need. There are times when we have, oh, you know, we just go along and you can't figure out what it is until finally a light goes off. Now, this is God's discipline. And it's also God's love. So what's good for this church, Laodicea, is equally good for this church or any other church. And the message of grace must keep being heralded. To, to make people understand, it's not by perfection. It's not by works. It'll never be by perfection or works. It's only going to be by one method and one method alone. When that's clear, Matt, if, if that was clear, you wouldn't have so many people trying to fruit inspect and come along and pick and look at me. You know, if you were really saved over, you, know, I, you don't really look saved to me back there. You know, I'm not sure that you're saved. You look like somebody who's not saved, by the way. <laughs> the church of the first uh, life jackets. You can start a new denomination. Everybody that comes through the door has to wear an inflatable, you know, that way you can tell they're saved. Never mind. That's a little bad pulpit humor. You don't want to live in here. <laughs> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I'd, I'd like to go into detail about this, but the only thing, as I mentioned at the beginning, famous painting that has been, per, kind of perpetuated this idea. There's been many paintings of this particular image of Christ uh, appearing at the door. It looks like he's cold and he's sh shaking and shivering and he's outside the door knocking and you'll see a little sliver of the door open and a little timid face looking through the door like this. It's a very famous painting, by the way, that I'm referring to. But it's an error, as I said. He's standing outside of the, of the church. <clears throat> and so it's imperative for us to understand we talk about modern preaching. If the modern preaching does not have the contents of the gospel, Christ is still outside the door. Christ's great commission in Matthew 28, 
it's a, it's a forgotten concept. He says, go out in the world, make learners, make, make disciples, make learners of the things that I told you, that I taught you, the things, essentially, you pass them on, you make learners of these people. And there's no way that you can learn anything as long as you are. Again, you go to school, what happens in school? You're going to have repetition, 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 repetition. You get, your kid, you're going to learn your, your, your uh, math tables. How do you learn the math tables? How do you learn how to write? Don't ask me because I, I learned how to write in a strange way. But how do you learn how to write? By repetition. And sometimes, rep most of the time, repetition is good. Sometimes not. If you're like me as a kid having to write on the board, you know, I had to write lines on the board. <laughs> I told you that story, right? Yes. I had to write something that contained the word shirt. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. You know, some of you, when, when, you, when you start writing too fast, you might omit a letter. <laughs> and that's exactly that's what I did. I got in worse trouble for it, too. <laughs> Just telling you, you know, listen, I never said that I was perfect either. I told you I'm not Mother Teresa. But I've, I certainly can understand what the Denningen process is. And it's important for us to understand that. This concept here of Christ at the door requires of any person in the pulpit, man or woman, to be preaching the gospel message. And it doesn't start and end with John 3.16. That may be a good bullet point for someone to learn, but it, it really is, and the sum total of this, if you think about it. I think about the genius of Dr. Scott's ministry, that 30 years is summed up in one thing. He could crystallize the resurrection message to a proof, to a concept, to where any, any, any listener at any level could take in the information, and that should become and has become for many, but should become the center point of our faith. That becomes that solid point, and everything else are dots. The dots may become uh, more as you move out to the far edges, but the center of it is based on the resurrection. Therein is the gospel message. So without that, when we start talking about the church, the Laodicean nature, that is everything for the people, the voice, I said Laodicea, the, the voice of the people, everything for the people, about the people, regarding the flesh and the temple of the people versus listening to the voice of God, reading the word, being obedient to the spirit of God, and the spirit speaking to this church saying, if you can hear, not all can hear. And now let's look at the promise. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even also as I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. The promise is pretty simple. The promise is to sit and to rule and to reign, and it really does come back to the same principles I've been talking about, the unity that, that the believer has with Christ that is beginning now with the deposit, the earnest of the deposit that's placed in us, that is to the time of full redemption, to rule and to reign with him, which, by the way, this book catalogs the return of Christ in the millennial picture with those coming behind him. Now think about this. Think about the whole concept. And this is just a bunch of crazy lunatic ideas or the promises are true. And each one of these promises latches on to, as I said, an eternal perspective, an eternal perspective understanding, and without that, you know, we could talk about all these things, commendation, rebuke, exhortation, the alternative, but here's a promise, even to the worst church. And that's why I said this last church must be understood as a church that even though gone astray, gone off the rails, whatever you want to call it, still being offered grace, unmerited favor, to be able to say for those people who overcome, and as I said on festival, because I taught on this word, nike, nikos, nikao, to overcome in the Greek, simply overcoming, the concept is very simple. You overcome by faith in him. He is the first goer. He is the one who showed the way. He is the first resurrection, the first fruit of the resurrection. 
He's the one setting the pattern. So he says, just as I also overcame and am set down with my father, as I am with my father, you will be with me. Now let me ask you a question. If you are part and parcel of what I'm saying, and you understand that, yes, we may not be exactly the Laodicean in church, but the danger is always there, the perils of prosperity, that we can get to the point of saying, we're okay, when in fact we need to obtain the things we need spiritually from him and be a little bit more vigilant. The promise remains, though, and I like the promise. It's a promise that says, even for people who have gone off the track, even for people who have lost their way, people who started off hot and on fire like those at Ephesus, like those, but now I'm speaking to the people in the church here. I'm speaking to some people who are listening who are not here. You started off hot, and that hotness, and I'm not talking about your looks, has now turned into <laughs> lukewarmness. The door of grace is still open for you. The door of grace is still open to those people who sit outside and think they're too bad. Their life has been too bad. Their lifestyle, their habits, whatever, whatever is in their past, it's too bad. The door of grace is open to you. The door of grace is open to anyone who will walk through it understanding that as long as, you, as long as you're clear, you don't do anything to earn or obtain it. You come through faith, by faith, and you understand that the door of grace is still open. If the ears can hear that message, the heart can make and the mind can make a turnabout that begin the beginning of that new walk and that new life once again. And no need to labor the point because it's pretty clear. But as I've gone through these churches, we've had the danger of losing love, the danger of the fear of suffering, the danger of compromise, spiritual and doctrinal. Uh, again, more... Uh, warning towards spiritual uh, darkness, if you will, the danger of not holding on to what has been received, and the danger of being lukewarm. Now, that once verse 22 comes to a close, the picture on earth has come to a close, and suddenly John is now looking to the things in heaven, and that's where, Lord willing, we, will, we may take up there next week in one form or another. <laughs> that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.